Welcome to the Foxtails International Podcast, where every week we explore new stories and tell old tales. We help build a community through the ancient art of storytelling. We tell our stories and hope to inspire you to find your voice, to stand up and sing out. Our stories shape our world. Your stories can change the world. I disagree with Shakespeare. We are more than actors on a stage. You are the author of your life story. Share the link with your friends. Support us by joining our Patreon team. And make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. Join us every week to fall in love with the world and all of its possibilities. This week's episode, we celebrate the rivers that flow through the heartlands of America. Come along for a journey. This first story is one of the first stories I wrote when I began working for the Spear de Peoria Riverboat. It's based on the journals of an old woman who lived in the 1880s. And I quote a small piece from Mark Twain's Life on the River and stitch it together with a song by my good friend Jim Post, Steamboat Coming. <laughs> Steamboat coming, steamboat coming, steamboat coming, black smoke fills the sky, doors swing open, the works come a-running, steamboat coming to town, boys come whooping and the dogs come a-barking, steamboat coming to town, horses in car trumbled over cobblestone, steamboat coming to town, lazy loaf for hurry run along, steamboat coming to town, she's long and slim, sleek and pretty, sailing down the river just like a cloud, fire in a smokestack lights up the sky, she's so loud, other babies cry. Steamboat coming, steamboat coming, steamboat coming, black smoke fills the sky. That's a song I will never get tired of. I grew up here on the banks of the Illinois River. And I remember when I was a child, when the steamboat would come to town, why, even before you saw the boat come round the bend, the captain, he knew this river like the back of his hand. He knew it was coming up on a town. He'd give a shout down through the brass tube to the boiler, and one of the roustabouts would butter a few logs, meaning they smeared him with some black tar, so it'd burn a little blacker, and that black smoke was like a flag. You could see it before you saw the boat come round the bend. And maybe he'd give a shout to the Calliope, and they'd fire up one of them old songs. You know the kind of song I'm talking about? The kind of song that makes you want to sing out? The song, kind of song that makes you want to dance or shed a tear like she's forever blowing bubbles? And you'd hear that song wafting on the wind a mile or more away. You'd see that black smoke before you saw the boat come round the bend, and a shout would come up from the wharf. Steamboat coming, steamboat coming, steamboat coming, black smoke fills the sky. And whatever you were doing, everybody ran down to the wharf. Why, even the preacher, he learned the hard way. One time in the middle of a love fest, in the middle of a wedding, just as a groom is about to say, I do, that shout come up, the church emptied out and had to finish the wedding down on the wharf. Or maybe it was a groom getting cold feet. <laughs> but the bride, she caught him and made him say his I do's. When that shout come up, everybody went down to the river except the sheriff. He'd open shop. Because these roustabouts, these big burly men, they love to drink and fight and cuss. And seemed like every time Steamboat came to town, somebody would end up in the slammer and have to sleep it off. Oh, and the shopkeepers, they would open shop. Because these packet boats, they'd carry 100 or 200 passengers from St. Louis or Peoria or maybe all the way from New Orleans. And these, these passengers would come into town and, and they would go shopping and those businesses would do more business in an afternoon than they would the rest of the week. And these tourists would be like, look here, this is probably made right here in Henry, Illinois. Little they know, the last steamboat brought those goods to town. Tourism is nothing new. And how have you been on board on them old boats? They often had crystal chandeliers, Persian carpets. They had an upright bass or, or banjo or piano. And sometimes the band would tumble out in the street and the whole town of Henry, Illinois would be dancing in the street. It was like the 4th of July and New Year's Eve all rolled in together. Sleepy little town of Henry, Illinois. Never saw so much excitement. But you better stay out of the way of them roustabouts. These big burly men would load and unload two tons of freight in a matter of moments. First, they would unload all the things that the shopkeepers had ordered. And then horses and carts rumbling over cobblestone with barrels of potatoes, barrels of wheat, hogs still on the hoof. 
Of course you take your pork to market while the pigs are still alive. The pigs are fresher that way. And the captain, he always gave him a fair price. Knowing whatever he paid, he'd get twice as much when he got to market. And who knows? Apples grown right here in Illinois. Sold to one of them steamboat captains. Could sail down the Illinois, down the Mississippi to New Orleans. Be loaded on one of them ocean boat going boats. And sail across the Atlantic. And who knows? An apple grown right here in Illinois could be served on a king's table in Paris or London. These river boats were our connection to the world. But when that first bell rang, that was a warning. It meant the roustabouts were done with their work. And townsfolk, we should get off. And tourists should get back on. Because when that second bell rang, that meant the boat was gone. And it seemed like every time that second bell ring, some townsfolk would still be on board the boat. They'd go running out the stage, sploosh, into the muddy river. And it seemed like every time that second bell ring, there'd still be some tourist in town. And the boat would be gone. They'd have to pay one of us to row them back out. It seemed like I could always earn a few pennies, and that's back when a few pennies counted for something. But when that steamboat left, the whole town would be standing on the wharf, waving and smiling. Our hearts a little richer. Our pockets a little thicker. <laughs> Why, even when the people are tiny little ants off in the distance, we're still waving and smiling. For it felt as though when that steamboat left, sleepy little town of Henry, Illinois, would roll over and pull up the blankets. Now, some folks say it was long time ago. Some folks say maybe it never really happened. Maybe it's all just some nostalgic dream. But I know it was real because I was there. And rumor has it, some of these steamboats are making a comeback. While the Belle of Louisville still sails the Ohio, the Delta Queen might be back on the water soon. And you know and I know, the spirit of Peoria still sails the Illinois. So maybe sometime you'll head down to the wharf. Maybe one of you will be the one who sees that black smoke. Maybe one of you will be the one who hears that shout. Steamboat coming, steamboat coming, steamboat coming, black smoke fills the sky. Captain is as calm as a kitten sleeping, steamboat coming to town. Everybody else is running or leaping, steamboat coming to town. Load and unload, two tons of freight, steamboat coming to town. Roused about driven by a cussing mate, steamboat coming to town. She's long and slim, sleek and pretty, sailing down the river just like a cloud. Fire in a smokestack, lights up the sky she's so loud all the babies cry steamboat coming steamboat coming steamboat coming black smoke fills the sky thank you now if you travel to starved rock on the spirit of peoria riverboat the folks at the park will tell you that this is a legend but i've done my homework and i can document the evidence to tell you the true story of Starved Rock. This next story, I believe, is a true story. Now, if you go to Starved Rock, and have you been to Starved Rock? They call it the legend of Starved Rock. Now, as a folklorist, I know the word legend means it may be partially true, it may be exaggerated over time, but I've done a lot of research, and I do believe this is the true story. And in the end, you'll hear the proof. In the time before time, the Illinois, which means the brave men or the real men, they lived from the shores of Lake Michigami, Lake Michigan, to the great father of waters, the Mississippi. They farmed in the fertile alluvial fill along the river shore. They hunted the great herds of Tatanka, the buffalo, and elk, Wapiti. In the time before time, the people lived plentiful. But as more and more Europeans came to the Atlantic coast, the tribes of the east were forced to the west. And tribes that once lived together harmoniously, forced into each other's territory, became warring nations. Now Chief Pontiac, you know Pontiac, the man the car was named after. He was born at Fort Detroit, you know Detroit. I think you say Detroit. Do you know who built Detroit? a Frenchman by the name of Cadillac. And they both drove Mitsubishis. <laughs> you might want to cut that out. <laughs> Pontiac and Cadillac were actually good friends. 
In the French and Indian Wars, who were the French really fighting? The British. The wars of Europe followed them to the New World, and both sides hired Indians as mercenaries to attack their enemy. When the French lost to the British, the French abandoned their allies, and Pontiac was outraged. How could he be so disrespected? So Pontiac was the first in the Great Lakes to try to organize all the tribes that once fought against each other to join forces and push the white man back into the sea from whence he had come. Pontiac's rebellion failed. And so Pontiac went to St. Louis across the Mississippi to negotiate the treaties. And he gave away land that did not belong to him. He gave away land that belonged to his enemy, the Illinois, Because the Illini did not join the Confederacy in the treaty negotiations, Pontiac argued fiercely for his friends and allies, but gave away land that was not his. In that meeting was a young Illinois who was outraged after the treaties were signed. He made sure that the bodyguards of Pontiac were liquored up. And when the guards were down, this young Illini put a knife between the ribs of Chief Pontiac and left him bleeding in the streets of St. Louis. Now the friends of Pontiac were outraged and they chased this young man across the Mississippi River into Illinois. They tracked him for several days. They caught him hiding in a tree, inside a hollow tree, and he met a fate worse than death. And then the friends of Pontiac, outraged, they decided to attack his village across the Illinois River from the rock. Now at this point, the Kaskaskia band of the Illinois, once a mighty race, had been greatly diminished in these wars. And most of them had left. There was once a village, I say village, there was once a huge city of 10,000 people living across from the rock. That would make it nearly as large as Paris or London. This was not a village. But when the French pulled out, most of the Indians followed them and moved to southern Illinois. So when the Sauk, the Fox, the Potawatomi, the Kickapoo, the Ottawa banded together to attack the Illini, it was a very small village. And when they saw their enemy amassed against them, what would you do? Fight or flight? Their first thought was, let's jump into our canoes and let's paddle downstream to Peoria. Our friends, the Peoria village, they will help us and maybe we can defeat our enemy. But if they were caught on the river in a non-defensible position, they would be slaughtered. So plan B, if you will, they decided to hide on top of the rock. They decided to hide on top of the rock and send a couple of canoes south as a little bit of a decoy to distract their enemy. And then the canoes would race ahead and they would warn the Peoria and maybe the Peoria would come north and they would follow them south, surround and conquer them. But the Sauk, the Fox, the Potawatomi, the Ottawa, the Kickapoo, they had scouts out ahead of their troops. They did not fall for the decoy. They saw that most of the village went to the top of the rock. Now, if you've ever climbed that rock, you know there's only one way up, which makes it a great place to build a fort. And that's why the French built the first St. Louis on top of the rock. But because there's only one way up, it also means there's only one way down. So it's easy for the enemy to lay in siege, to surround the rock, and starve them out. And that's exactly what they did. On the top of the rock, they could look across the river. They could see their cornfields ripening in the late summer sun, but they soon ran out of food. Now, you could live without food for several days, some of us maybe a week or more. But without water... Even though the river was directly below them, if they tried to lower a bucket or a gourd, the gourd would be smashed, the rope would be cut without water. Maybe a few days at the most. It wasn't long before buzzards began to gather in great numbers at the foul stench of death. Their enemy just waited them out. When they met no resistance... They charged to the top of the rock and they actually found one young man clinging to the last threads of life. They rescued him 
They brought him food and water so he could live to tell the tale, to instill fear in the hearts of their enemy. This young Elinowick, he moved downriver to Peoria, where he had cousins among the Peoria tribe. And when the French settlement grew, he actually married a French girl, and he took a French name, Antoine Lebel. And when Peoria became an American city, a reporter found this old Indian and interviewed him, the last survivor, the only survivor of Starved Rock. And that's how I know this story is true. But they say, still to this day, if you go to the top of the rock late at night when the moon is full and the wind is whispering in the oak leaves, you'll hear the moaning and groaning of those who starved upon the rock. Starved rock. Thank you. This next story is based on a true story that really did happen to me. My father was actually a shipbuilder who worked on Great Lake freighters. And I've spent much of my life messing around in boats. I wrote the uh, canoe and kayak map for the Illinois River. And I've been fishing as before I could really walk. I bet I was in a boat with my dad. And there's really nothing I would rather do than be fishing, especially with my father, even if you're not catching anything. It's a lot of fun to go fishing. Do you like to fish? I remember one day, I was a small boy, and we were out rowing around a little John boat out in one of the backwater sloughs, and I was trying to figure out where those fish are hiding. And I saw a spot over near shore, looked as good as any. So I had my trusty Zepco 202 with an eagle claw hook, and I put a little worm on that hook I'd caught in the backyard with a flashlight the night before, and, and tied on a little lead weight. And I'm, see that spot? I think I can, I think I can. <laughs> Sploosh, right where I wanted it. Glug, glug, glug. No sooner had my sinker sunk than I saw a little V moving towards my line, just as though it was meant to be. I reeled in the slack and tightened it up, and then I felt a little tug on my pole. Now, if you're a fisherman or a fisherwoman, you know you don't want to set the hook too soon. I waited till that little tug became a big tug. And as soon as it did, I set that hook and I reeled it in. I said, shoo Daddy, it's the biggest fish I ever caught. I got it in close to the boat. My dad said, don't try to pick it up. It'll snap a 10-pound test line. And uh, he reaches over and he gets under its gills and he pulls that catfish in the boat. And the first thing he said was, shoo that's the biggest catfish I've ever seen. Now, as you can see, I'm not a very large man. But believe it or not, I was smaller when I was a boy. And that catfish was mighty near as big as I was. It wasn't a state record, not even close. Anybody know the state record? In Illinois, I believe for flathead, it's 94 pounds. Well, my catfish wasn't close. It was about 57 and a half pounds, nearly as big as I was. Now, in those days, we didn't have great big coolers with lots of ice. If you caught a fish, you just ran wrapped it up in moist newspaper. Well, we carried in on the, I, my dad carried it and I held the tail, <laughs> onto the porch and I ran the house and said, Mom, Mom, you got to come on out and see this fish. My mother came out. She took one look at that fish. She said, shoo that's the biggest catfish I've ever seen. I said, Mom, can we eat it for supper? She said, that catfish is so big, we could eat it for breakfast and supper and lunch and breakfast and lunch and supper and supper and lunch and breakfast. <sighs> Truth is, a 57-pound catfish would feed five boys for several days. And my mother, she was always pulling on my leg. That's why I walk a little lopsided still. But we unrolled the newspaper, and hey, catfish looked kind of dead. His eyes were all bugged out, but his lips were still going. Now, if you know catfish, they're kind of hard to kill. I said, Mom, Dad, he's still alive. We can't eat him if he's still alive. See, in those days, we hadn't heard of sushi before. And my dad was kind of tired. It was actually after supper. And, and so he said, boy, uh, we're going to put that catfish in the bathtub and we'll skin him up tomorrow. Well, I didn't like that idea, but he was the captain of our ship. And at least my mom let him think he was. And, and it was after bedtime. So we iced him down on the back porch and we decided we'd clean him the next morning. And I went on upstairs and I went to bed. Now, do you remember when you were a kid, like the night before Christmas or the night before your birthday or the night before summer vacation? Take all that excitement and roll it into one. I was so excited. I lay there tossing and turning. I had trouble getting to sleep. But I guess eventually I fell asleep because next morning I woke up 
And I put on my bathrobe and I ran downstairs and I went out onto the back porch and the catfish was gone. Somehow during the night he had flopped off and I found him in the dewy wet grass and he looked kind of dead. His eyes were all bugged out, but his lips were still going. I said, Mom, Dad, come here. You're not going to believe it. He's still alive. He's still alive. My, my dad came out still wearing his pajamas with his cup of coffee. I said, how, how could it be that he's still alive? Now, maybe you were lucky enough to have a dad like my dad. I could ask the craziest questions, and he always had an answer. And now that I'm a dad, I can tell you maybe sometimes he's making it up. But I said, Dad, how could he still be alive? My father scratched his head, and he said, you know, I bet there's just enough dew in the grass. Just enough moisture to keep him alive. I said, if he's still alive, can we keep him as a pet? They laughed. But how many of you are really good at the puppy dog face? I said, please. It still sometimes gets me what I want. Now, catfish that, well, that, well, that, that big, what are you going to do with it? We decided to put him in the bathtub. Remember those old clawfoot tubs, little plug on a chain? I put the plug in, turn on the hot water, turn on the cold water, put my elbow in, make sure the temperature was just right. And when I put that catfish in, whoa, he looks so happy. Have you ever seen a catfish smile? I don't think they can, <laughs> but he would have if he could. <laughs> he just kind of moved back and forth. He was too long to turn around. And I forget if it was a Saturday or whatever, but I had chores to do. Remember chores? My always, father always said, that's how you build character. <laughs> so I went out in the backyard, and I forget if I was uh, mowing the lawn or raking the leaves, but uh, uh, as soon as I was done with my chore, I came back in the house, and I went upstairs, and I went into the bathroom. The bathtub was empty. You know, catfish have that little fin. He got it hooked on the chain and unplugged the tub, and all the water ran out. And he looked kind of dead. His eyes were all bugged out, but his lips were still going. Now, I told you my dad was the smartest man I ever knew, but he wasn't very good at fixing stuff. And the bathroom faucet had a little drip, 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 and the catfish got his nose underneath, and there was just enough water to keep him alive. I said, Mom, Dad, looks like he's learning to breathe air like us people can. If he can breathe air... Maybe I can teach him to do other things that people can do. My dad said, like, what? And I said, uh, maybe I could teach him how to walk. Now, you can laugh if you like, but look it up on, on Wikipedia. There's actually two catfish called walking catfish, one in Florida, one in Africa. And I said, if a catfish in Florida can walk, why can't one up here? I got him out of the bathtub. I stood him up on his hind fins. He had trouble keeping his balance, and so I gave him a push, and he started walking around the bathroom, and I figured if he could walk, maybe I could put him to work. <laughs> I took him out in the backyard, and I leaned him on the lawnmower, and I fired up, broom, and he starts mowing the lawn. <laughs> it helped to hold him up, and he got a lot of work done. Now, my neighbors, they thought that was really cool. One of my neighbors, Sally Grzbowski, she said, if he can mow your lawn, can he mow mine? I said, now you're talking. That summer, we made a lot of money, like $64.17. Now, most kids make money, and their parents take it away from them. Got to save for college, right? But have you ever heard of a catfish going to Harvard? He got to spend his money. wasn't fair. But sometimes he'd treat me. We'd go to the movie, like the Rio Theater, and he loved anything with fish, like Flipper and Free Willy. Now, I can see some of you think this is a funny story. But truth be told, it's a tragedy. One day I came from school, and my dad said, hey, boy, let's take that catfish here's fishing. Oh, I said, Dad, don't talk about fishing in front of the F-I-S-H. He might think we're trying to kill one of his cousins. My dad said, nah, his brain's the size of a lima bean. He thinks he's one of us. Well, my dad already had the fishing poles ready. So we took him down the river and put him in the boat. Now, he'd never been on this end of a fishing pole before, so I had to cast out for him. But wouldn't you know, he got the first bite. But when the fish pulled on the end of his line, he was kind of slippery and slimy. He slipped, he fell out of the boat into the river, and the catfish, he drowned. And that was the end of Mr. Catfish. <laughs> Well, I've been floating down this river Seven years and four score I've seen a lot of changes I hope to see some more Chicago sewer is my river A river of my dirty dreams Industrial pollution 
And nightmare's what I mean Imagine swimming in a suit So dark and murky black A soup of chemicals and food And oxygen and lax Cause I'm a catfish, catfish Singing the catfish blues I'm a catfish, catfish Bringing you the news Well, Asian carp, they eat my food And take up all my space Competitive displacement Stares me in the face Gobi fish, they eat my food So I can reproduce Invasive species are a pain And my slimy old kaboot Cause I'm a catfish, catfish Singing the catfish blues I'm a catfish, catfish Bringing you the news Well, you don't know the trouble Till you know the trouble I'm in My brother caught a hook in the face And someone took his skin He ended up on your dinner plate I hope it tasted good My mama was your meal last night Don't look at me like I'm food Cause I'm a catfish, catfish Singing the catfish blues I'm a catfish, catfish Bringing you the news I'm a catfish Singing the catfish blues I'm a catfish I'm bringing you the news I'm a catfish Thank you for joining us for another episode of Foxtails International Podcast. Follow this link to invite me to your community, or take a look at my schedule to see when I might be performing near you. Share the link with your friends, support us by joining our Patreon team, and make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. Join us every week to fall in love with the world and all of its possibilities.